Well, today we're going to be discussing ways that you can improve your swimming and specifically ways you can improve your swimming so that you can swim an Ironman distance, 3.8 kilometers, feeling more calm and feeling more confident. I ideally want, Chris, in this episode, people going away thinking, I've got strategy now that I can go away and by race day, I'm going to be 100% confident and confident in the fact I'm going to be feeling really calm in the water come race day. We are going to talk about training. We are going to talk about drills. We are going to talk about all the tips and techniques that we have along the way. But this is the first and the most important message I want to pass over to people that are listening. The best thing that you can have come any triathlon distance race day in the water is a feeling of total calm and a feeling of real confidence that A, you're going to complete the swim without massive amounts of anxiety coming over your head as you're swimming and that B, you've got a rough idea of how long that that swim is going to take you, whether you're a person who is fighting the cutoff or a person who is, I don't know, swimming 50, 55 minutes for the distance, feeling calm and confidence in your ability to do that, I think is the absolute key. And that's the framework that we're going to have this whole conversation around. That sounds brilliant. I think this, um, hopefully, well, it's exactly the kind of podcast that I would have been looking for and that would have been really useful to me, you know, a few years back when I was trying to improve my swimming. And I think every athlete at this point can improve their swimming, as you were saying, doesn't matter if they're 50 minutes or fighting for the cutoff. Every swimmer, every athlete has had that experience where it becomes uncomfortable in the water. And so we need to approach that first before we even think about how quickly we can do our CSS test or our 100s. So I, I'm looking forward to this one. It's uh, yeah. it's a very complicated one as well. And so I think yeah. the listeners need to be a little bit patient with this subject. Swimming is a frustrating sport, but it's also what fascinates us. So hopefully by the end of it, people can walk away and, well, swim away and um, yeah, feel more confident with what they're doing. That's, I think it's absolutely the key part for every swimmer at every level, bar the very, very top pros and age groupers. And even some of them, if you think back to some of the episodes we've had, suffering anxiety around swimming isn't just limited to slower swimmers. I know some really good swimmers who've competed at a pro level have been under 50 minutes for the Ironman distance and have had panic attacks in the water and it's completely ruined their races. So it isn't about often being a good swimmer or not. It's about learning to deal with those anxieties. And if we can get our head around those anxieties, all the rest of it is going to fall into place. So the first thing I want to start this with is by saying for 99% of the people on Ironman race day, the swim is not a race. We're not racing people. We're not trying to go as fast as we can. And it's important to stress that because the not racing it part of it puts you in a very different mindset to if you are racing. So again, the bigger context here is you've got between, for most people, an hour and two hours in the water as a warm up to between five and eight hours on the bike and then between, what, three and seven hours on the run. Trying really, really hard and being in the mindset of going, I must go as fast as I can is not going to help almost anybody in that 99 percent with the rest of their day so that's the really important takeaway here the feeling calm feeling confident feeling relaxed that's how most people need to be in their heads and that's what we're going to start by talking about today let's start off then today let's have a little chat you and me about our experiences as people who came into swimming later in life because neither of us were swimmers when we came into the sport were we and well, you much more so than me, but we both got pretty good at it. And so I think that gives us a unique understanding that maybe, I don't know, if you are an ex-Olympic swimmer who swam twice a day from the age of seven, I think you were a very good swimmer from the age of eight and you were trained your little tail off the whole time through. Doesn't, in my experience of the coaches that helped me in the early days, didn't make for the most understanding and compassionate coach to help somebody who had come in from a biking or running background was quite fit, absolutely clueless to how to apply that fitness into the water to make any kind of forward progress. Yeah, totally. It's, um, it's a very different world to the world of swimming. And 
however good you are on the bike, however good you are on the run, doesn't usually translate into being good in the water. And that's personally what fascinated me because I felt as if I could get aerobically fit on the bike and run and I could kind of match anyone in my so circle of friends and training athletes. But as soon as you throw me in the water, I'm the furthest away from the fast lane and I've got this, you know, anxiety around, can I do 400 meters? Can I do 200 meters? And that's in a confined swimming pool. If you then throw me into the ocean or into a big lake, it's a totally, it's very uncomfortable. And actually, mm. if you can challenge yourself to being comfortable within that uncomfortable environment, it's a very, very fulfilling process to go through. It's a life skill and it's, it's something that to me fascinates me because it's not just about how much effort you put into it and how hard you work at it. It's something slightly different. It's a kind of a fine art. It's a fine motor skill process. It's every element has a then a knock on effect onto your technique. And so as you were giving us an intro, Rob, um, you struck a chord because you were saying not everyone is we shouldn't really be approaching this as we're trying to race the swim in triathlon and i totally agree with you and the kind of takeaway i got from that was let's maybe reframe it and not think about i really want to be a fast swimmer which i think is a lot of the mentality that we have especially from bike and run but if we can approach the swimmers i want to be the most efficient swimmer that i can be to protect my bike and run I think is kind of the first stepping stone towards mm, aligning our efforts towards being a better triathlete. And so don't think I want to be a fast swimmer. You want to be an efficient swimmer. And therefore, what are the steps to becoming an efficient swimmer? And hey, guess what? If I'm an efficient swimmer, that will soon translate into being a fast uh, swimmer yeah 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 totally what was what was your experience of coming into swimming then how long did it take you to go from someone who someone who was a good bike runner but who essentially I mean we were the same weren't we when we started we we couldn't swim 25 meters literally and to get from that point to even for me, the big challenge was like, okay, I'm, I've entered this pool sprint. I wonder if they'll let me put my feet down at the end of a hundred <laughs> meters and have a little rest. I mean, up until about two weeks before the first race day, that was me being thoroughly convinced I was just going to have to do that. Even if it involved putting my feet down and kind of bobbing in the shallow end for five <laughs> or 10 seconds, I was going to have to do that. And lo and behold, in the week before it happened, I managed to string together a continuous 400 for the first time ever. But the mindset of going from, it didn't never occur to me that I wouldn't be able to complete a run or wouldn't be able to complete a bike, but it was this very real challenge of not being able to complete something that was sort of eight minutes long, essentially. Mm. Oh, yeah, very similar position for me. Um, and I remember I was reading all the triathlon books out there to how to become a better swimmer. And I remember one of the first chapters was set a benchmark, set a test baseline. And so I read about this CSS test and I was like, oh, brilliant. I'll do that. I, I couldn't complete my first CSS test because I can't, I can't swim a continuous 400. Yeah. So you know, as you were talking, I was laughing and I'm certainly not laughing at anyone that's in that position. I'm laughing because it's bringing back some pretty haunting memories of me thinking I was a fit mid twenties guy aiming to hopefully one day get on the island of Hawaii to race some of the best athletes in the world. And the reality was that I was in the kind of slow granny lane there doing aqua jogging and I'm absolutely fighting my absolute hardest to do a 400 and not being able to do it. So, yeah, yeah it's um, it's pretty sobering, isn't it? When you, you, you kind of, you, you're back to square one and it's incredibly daunting to think that you can't do that in the pool. And then you think about doing that on race day with however many hundred or thousand athletes around you trying to get around one boy. And yeah, it's not surprising that swimming is the biggest barrier to triathlon. Um, but that's also why triathlon's so beautiful because it attracts all of us from different backgrounds. And some of us may have never biked before. Some of us have rarely run. But when it comes to swimming, a lot of us are in the same boat and we we all find a way. It takes mm -hmm. patience and it takes technique and it takes a lot of planning. But if you are excited by the idea of improving your swim, then you will get there. 
deeply satisfying was my was my experience at some sort of I think I found it to be letting go of the idea of doing hard work going in I, initially I went in and I would look at swim sets that had eight by 25 or eight by 50 and in my head they immediately became the same as a set would be on the running track okay I understand this I do 50 meters and then have a rest and I do another 50 meters but the first thing I couldn't understand was how am I so out of breath after 50 meters that it's not taking the you know, the, the typical swim set that had a five second or a 10 second break at the end of it before going again, I needed two minutes because I was approaching the, the 50 meter rep as if it was a 400 on the track. It was a full on effort. And that's the first thing I think that I misunderstood was the, the gap was there to give me a little break to let the muscles recover, not so that I could go absolutely flat out in training and try and and try and have a real sort of aerobic interval session. So if someone's listening in that position, I think that's the first thing to accept. Your swimming has to be a process of learning a skill rather than trying to train a physical attribute. It's not a fitness event initially, at least. It's a skill acquisition event. And almost the less hard you try, the more rewarding that's going to be for you in the early days, I think. Yeah, totally. And I think there's an element of... Um... And I've put myself in this category, but people trying to run before they can walk in swimming. So if you look at a fairly novice swimmer who's on their triathlon pathway, look at them during their warm up. And if they're heavy breathing at the end of their warm up or they're, you know, they come to the end of their 25 meters and they're doing a big gasp until they push off again, that's showing them that they're their biggest barrier for sure is their technique because any warm up should be very easy on the aerobic system to start with and you should be able to swim a really nice consistent 100 meters 200 meters and at the point where actually that warm up is turning into a bit of an interval set because you're just trying to get through it you can kind yeah. of forget the interval that's the now. flag isn't it that's yeah. the red flag right there yeah totally so it's again it comes back to that efficiency and so start with your warm up by making sure that that's a really nice, um, consistent, smooth process within your swimming. And don't don't worry about the times, don't worry about the clock. It has to be technique and it has to be about efficiency and lowering the stress on your aerobic system in that phase. Yeah, good. Well, if that if the listener is, is nodding along with this and saying, okay, great, well, hopefully we will have some answers for you in this episode today about how we can get you from the position that you're in that we were both in and into the into the better position before we go on though chris just give us give us some numbers from going from not being able to complete 100 meters when you first started swimming what did you get yourself down to over the ironman distance over a period of and and what period of time um so my best swims which actually became fairly consistent in the open water um by the end was around the 57 minute mark um but Again, I don't want to fall into the trap of talking about fast swim times. It's I, I, I feel as if I could have gone faster. And, uh, you know, 55 on the clock, I think, was realistic. But I soon found out that at what cost, and that was a big cost in terms of efficiency and the physical output. So, therefore, I was quite happy with that 57, 58 kind of average for an Ironman swim. But... I was turning up to the pool, you know, four or five times a week with the objective of becoming more efficient to produce that time as opposed to lowering that time. And I played around with that. You know, I was doing some massive interval sessions some big swim mileage. But actually, my biggest limiter, again, was how efficient I could be. And mm. to answer that, it was going to be through more drills and easy swimming versus you know, I was part of swim clubs and they thrash themselves. They they swim really hard on a threshold set, a VO2 set, big distance set, all within a matter of a few days. And actually, aerobically, yeah, maybe that was complementing my overall triathlon package. But at the end of the day, I wasn't able to translate that into my race day. So I think that's the kind of first takeaway is approach your swimming with, okay, I might be a two minute per hundred swimmer right now. How do I make sure that I can stick to that 200 side to that two minutes per hundred, but at a less 
physical cost. And that's the first step towards your time actually slowly but surely coming down, which yeah. is, you know, it's a bit of a mindset shift, isn't it? Well, I think we'll, we'll go on to that in a bit more detail later on. But firstly, how long did it take you to go from 50 meter swimmer to swim in a 57 minute Ironman? What was the time frame that took you over? Um, after three years, I... Three years. Yeah, three Great. years. Well, three that's years a really of... good number for people to have in the head because it shows what's possible in terms of like, okay, so you can't swim right now, but we now have an example of someone who who can do that in a three-year period. My numbers are going from not being able to swim 50 meters to doing my first half Ironman and then an Ironman six months later in a period of about a year to go from not being able to swim. And I was probably in my first Ironman, I think I swam about 70 minutes. So it just shows people that if you are already from like a relatively fit background, you can, you know, the progression can be really fast because it's not the fitness making it or the, not the lack of fitness making it impossible in the early days. It's just learning to apply some force and technique to the water. So if you've got your Ironman coming up in six months or a year, we feel you. Okay. I got there in a year. Chris got to Kona level in three years. So that puts a kind of what's possible framework on it, I think, to start with, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Good. Right, should we kick off then with where we were up to? Yeah, so I think if we refer back to your first kind of um, main barrier that you highlighted, which was we want to make sure that all the swimmers that we help get to that start line in a relaxed, confident, calm way. So how do we make sure that our athletes and any other athletes that are listening, what tips can they actually go away with today knowing that on race day they're feeling confident and calm yeah 100 percent. i think the first thing that this comes down to for all beginners and a lot of a lot of swimmers who we describe as intermediate to advanced swimmers confident competent age groupers the first thing it comes down to is actually breathing and especially for our beginners who find that they're in that position of being out of breath after 25 minutes, really, really sucking the air in after only swimming for 25, 50 meters. I know that was my challenge. I reckon it was probably your challenge in the early days as well. What we see is that the athlete is simply not breathing out into the water as they're turning the head to the side, they're trying to breathe out and in at the same time. And so that's the first thing for beginners to accept is you don't even have to be doing any swimming to get better at breathing you can practice this in the shallow end of your pool on a quiet day and simply take a breath duck down under the water blow your breath out come back up to breathe breathe in duck back under blow it out again and it sounds really really simple it is really really simple but often people don't want to do the simple stuff for the fear of looking silly in front of people so if you're listening and you're a beginner and that's you you're a fit runner or cyclist and you can't swim it's the breathing exercises is the place we start with. And even like back in the day, helping Matt Botterill start triathlon, that's where I started with him. And he, I remember we had a laugh afterwards. He was saying like, I can swim a bit. I'm, I can, I can do this, but he saw the value afterwards and, oh, okay. Right. So we're really embedding this mindset of real calm, blowing out our breath into the water, and really calmly breathing in with our head out. That can just revolutionize a swimmer right from the off yeah totally i I actually went through a phase of doing that um the exact kind of drill that you were just talking about and i'd do it in the deep end and i'd exhale underwater i'd drop all the way down to the bottom of the pool cross my legs at the bottom of the pool exhale and then come back up and i'd integrate as part of my warm-up and cool down and you feel silly for the first few but actually other swimmers know what you're doing we're all in the same boat right you know, if you do that week on week on week, after a month, that is going to feel totally natural. But what's really hard is being strong enough mentally to, ah, uh, I'll skip that bit. I'll just get onto the main set. Don't skip it. Take a piece out of the main set if, you, if you're stuck on time and put this bit in, especially this time of year is the perfect time to do it. And it doesn't take long, you know, a couple of minutes on each swim session where you can do that. It's going to go, yeah, really long way. Mm. 
And typically it's a real challenge for athletes who come into club swimming sessions and want to get in a lane and are competitive mentally, a type A personalities. They don't want to go down a lane into a perceived lower ability of athlete. Mm. I'm picturing so many athletes I've coached in pool deck over the years who they're almost like a type that arrives and you go, okay, you're going to want to be in lane two, but I'm going to ask you to be in lane four because the challenge is not how fit you are. You're obviously 8% body fat and you can obviously run a 36 minute 10 K. The challenge is that we've got to get you to be able to be confident breathing out into the water first. And that's not going to happen if you're under pressure of swimming a set and meeting turnarounds and things. So Mm. I really can't stress that enough. If we can get people calm and confident and breathing out into the water that's the basis of everything else and we can then we can then work on being confident breathing in with our head tucked in and turned to the side can't we yeah totally and have the confidence in your training plan that you're getting enough hard aerobic training through your bike and your run training the pool is not the time to do it especially this time of year you've got your biggest limiter which is going to be something within your technique focus on that right now and actually you know you can feel good about not thrashing yourself on every pool session. This is the time to focus on your limiter, focus on your breathing, which I think is probably going to be the biggest limiter to a lot of the athletes we're talking to right now. Mm. And just focus on that for four to six weeks and see where you come out. And the likelihood is that you're going to, you're going to shoot up in efficiency. Yeah. I was amazed the first time I took um, an underwater camera to the pool and filmed athletes swimming by how many people, even in lane one, guys and girls who were mid fifties, Ironman swimmers were not breathing out at all into the water and pointing that out to them was a massive challenge because obviously they're already very, very good swimmers, but the le- the level was, we can make you better. There's no question. It's not about making you try harder or work harder. It's just changing this technique. It was very, very interesting. And mm. something that if anyone's watching this or listening and, and hasn't seen this, go do a search for uh, the Swim Smooth videos that they talk about their uh, underwater duck down brill, uh, drill breathing exercises. Really simple, but really effective. And there's a reason that they start from that point forward. It, it is the basis, much more so than the S-shaped pull and body position mm. and things. So that's great. I think we've we've got that across, hopefully, that for everybody – Breathing is the source or breathing badly, I think, is the source of all anxiety. That feeling of having not enough carbon dioxide in your bloodstream because you're hyperventilating effectively. That is a massive contributor to people feeling anxiety and panic in the water. And so the breathing is the first place to start if you're a person who has worries around the swim, even more than, you know, people I've worked with have said I've been to a psychologist and a psychiatrist to work this through often it's a physical reaction to a physical problem rather than a psychological thing so I think that's the first place to start perfect absolutely yep good okay so once we've worked on our breathing and we've learned to both breathe out under the water and we've learned to breathe in calmly and and in a relaxed manner and we're really comfortable and confident that we can get the air in and we can get the air out The next thing I want to advise people to do is to start to work on being able to breathe on both sides or bilaterally. We'll describe this. Now, everyone hates me when I make them do this as a beginner because it's almost like, well, I can do it on this side. So why should I bother? I'd encourage beginners, especially to learn to try and do it right from the off, because while you're learning, you may as well learn on both sides because being able to breathe bilaterally will be great for evening out your stroke. I'll help you iron out any potential flaws in the future. It's also great for race day if you need to breathe to one side or the other deliberately because there are waves or the sun rises in one direction or whatever. Super, super interesting and important way to develop your swimming, isn't it? I know that um, this is the exact point in the podcast, if I was a listener, that I'd skip on to the next section <laughs> because I yeah. think this, this is not for me. This is for either the real beginner swimmer or whatever. I'm swimming fine on one side and I might be different I feel different but this is I'm talking to myself you need to be listening to this point because we all skip it it's so so important and the amount of times and actually you know I still suffer with slight impingement in my right shoulder and I'm sure it's because I was a one-sided breather for the majority of my swimming and my swimming would have benefited massively if from the start I actually 
put the time and suffered through those sessions and the warm-ups and cool-downs and focus on my bilateral breathing and I didn't and it's, it's one of my big regrets um, and you look at all the kind of most efficient swimmers within the sport on race day they might be mostly leaning towards one side but that doesn't mean that they're not comfortable bilateral swimmers and you have to have that to be able to iron out your biggest limiters so yeah i can't stress how important enough to to at least be able to do it and you should be able to integrate it into your warm and cool down for a start when you get to race day you know the majority can be lent towards one side personally i'm happy with that are you happy with that rob or yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I think race day is a kind of separate thing, but it's mm. the it's the embedding of a of a balanced two sided technique in training. That means, you know, ideally people can then choose to breathe either side if they want to look around them and see what's going on. And if they are more comfortable, which I think everybody is, everyone's got a favored mm. side. Obviously, it's going to tend to that on race day, but the ability to do it in training. I remember I made personally speaking my biggest leap forward as a swimmer when a coach set me the task of doing a weekly 500 meters bilateral and what I found was it it limited how hard I could try because I could only breathe every three strokes if I if I tried to go a bit harder and, and I was tending into that well now I need to breathe every stroke I had to back the pace off and it made me it was like a light bulb moment of oh okay this is like the this is like the natural limit of how fast you can swim bilaterally. Let's see if you can get faster swimming bilaterally by exactly as you said, by being more efficient, by having better technique rather than trying hard. Because at some point when you try harder, there's that there's that kick into, OK, now I need to breathe more frequently and it has to be on this side. It was really interesting and I've still got written down somewhere. I think it was a seven week progression of my times going down from like nine minutes, 30 for 500 meters down to, I think down to close to seven minutes over a seven week period, but all of it being rigidly bilateral. And it was like a marker of almost like a sub-maximal time trial, if you know what I mean. It's yeah. like, okay, you're not trying any harder, but you're getting more efficient at doing this. It was a real, it was a real interesting learning point. And I really felt it moved me forward as a swimmer yeah totally that's really interesting um and when i think back about when bilateral breathing helped me the amount of times i had to use it in a race not because i felt the need but because it was going to help me be a more efficient swimmer at the time so yeah you know if one of our main objectives in the open water is to draft to draft a swimmer that's slightly quicker than you at the time how are you going to find those feet if you can only see 50% of the people, 50% of your environment? So I was always checking to my left every so often to see if there are a better pair of feet to follow, or actually we're probably deviating off course and exactly. it's time to, to go yeah. left. And if we're talking about efficiency being our key word from this podcast, being able to bilaterally breathe on your own terms at your own speed and time that is definitely going to help you get from a to b as efficiently as possible so if you know if you're questioning whether it's worth putting in the effort to becoming a bilateral swimmer think about on race day you suddenly get a whole menu of feet to pick on of which you're going to draft as opposed to only 50 percent of your vision so yeah and we i think we've got examples of that even with one of our athletes david who managed to qualify for kona that was one of his big takeaways that, yeah wasn't it yeah he 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 was a good swimmer, but he managed to turn being a good swimmer into a really efficient and one with race craft. And how can you get that race craft? Well, you've got to have the whole vision. You've got to be able to see what's going on around you. And so he's actively picking on which feet he wants to follow, as opposed to being restricted to the ones that are just in front of you. Yeah. 100%. And it also goes back to what we said about being a confident and calm swimmer. If you've got the ability to look either side of you as you're swimming, if you've got the ability to pick out what's going on, if you end up, as we all do it sometimes, surrounded by a couple of people in a little group and you don't feel comfortable and confident, if you can see that over to the left or over to the right, there's a little bit more space. It just gives you more of a sense of confidence in the water rather than a sense of impending mm. 
you know, the situation's going on and I don't have control around this. And that, I think, pays dividends for athletes, no matter how fast they are in the water, whether you're swimming 150 or 50 minutes, having that ability to feel more comfortable and confident in the, the environment you're in is going to lead to a better overall experience for sure. So I'm going to put you on the spot at this point. Um, we're telling the athletes that it's crucial to be a bilateral swimmer. How do they do it? How do you in ingrain it? I think it's just about making yourself do it in your relaxed swim sets as often as you can. And one of the tips I've used with athletes is dead, dead simple. It's if you have a preferred side and a, let's call it a, a weaker side for the sake of being really clear what's going on. When an athlete does a push and glide off the wall, take the breath on your weaker side as you break out of the swim, mm. because that's always the point where you can apply stress and there's kind of lower consequences there. It's that one breath every length. If that's all you get in to start with, great. But if you don't get a very good one, it's going to be a pretty poor start to your length. And so in a way, it really makes you focus on, okay, I know what's happening. I'm pushing and gliding off the wall. I'm taking that one stroke and turning my head. It's kind of not high consequences, but it's a, it's a nice little regular break in their swim. So I'd go with that. I'd go with a push off the wall each time. What about you? How would you, how would you do that? Um, I definitely did what you suggested. Um, another one that um, helped me get that breakthrough was I'd do 25 meters um, just lying on one side. So arm in front and you're, you're rotating your trunk to the side that you're breathing and that's going to feel really comfortable on your natural breathing side but on the second 25 when you're coming back you don't have a choice you're, you've got to do it on the opposite side and so that's just going to give your time it's going to give you time to work out getting your face in the water rotating your neck creating that little wave where you can actually exhale in and intake the uh, the oxygen at that point and you don't have to worry too much because you're not um worried about your cadence of uh your catch and you know your stroke rate all these things that that they're put aside because you're not actually yeah. doing a full stroke and just being comfortable on that non-comfortable side and just lying there and you just do a little flutter kick it doesn't have to be a crazy kick and again it's all coming back to efficiency and uh, that body position and slowly but surely that's the thing that really was kind of the breakthrough moment for me because when mm. i knew that i could do a really confident comfortable 25 meters on my weaker side then i knew that i could slowly start integrating it as part of a full stroke yeah yeah that's good it's almost like a an ad adaptation of a 636 drill but only yes. breathing on your weaker side exactly yeah. and again just to stress to everybody make life as easy on yourself as you can at this point, as you're learning to breathe on your weaker side by not going hard, the more relaxed you can be, the slower you can do this, the less, the less you need to breathe effectively, the more easier it's going to be to embed that technique. And I think the reason the push and glide off the wall works so well is that that's the point an athlete's velocity through the water is going to be the highest. And so that's the chance they're going to have of the, if you like the more defined bow wave for them to breathe into without needing to kind of think about it too much later on in the stroke. So, yeah. So drill it in first, introduce it during a, a push and glide off the wall. And then the next step I think is to try and introduce one offside breath in the middle of a length as you get to that. Yeah. I'm getting quite excited. The athletes just talking about this. I'm such a geek, Chris. I, lo I love mm. this. The, the way of unpicking a sport and breaking it down into a way you can pick up the new skills. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And I think a massive takeaway is, uh, you know, I keep, I think I'm repeating myself by saying integrate it. And what I mean by that is not just doing it, you know, on your easy Monday swim, I'm talking about integrating it every time you get to the pool, it's being integrated into that swim set into the warm up or the cool down. And you have to do it little and often and, you know, doing one massive technique set a week is not the way to go. It's 
every time you turn up to the pool, force yourself to do that uncomfortable drill, force yourself to bilateral breathe, force yourself to do, you know, five drop downs into the deep end when you're exhaling underwater. And it feels silly for the first few times, but if you keep doing it, you will be that front pack swimmer that you dream of. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, Chris, even if people don't get to be front pack swimmers, as long as they become confident swimmers, mm. and the, the big payback for me has always been the person who thinks they can't do the triathlon because they're ridden with anxiety, whether they're a fast swimmer or a slow swimmer, mm. the people who think I can't do this, the people who don't enjoy swimming, if, if you can get a light to go on in them and go, actually, I've just realized them. You know, type A personalities are brilliant for this because all of a sudden they get a new challenge and they don't allow themselves to go, I'm not very good at this. And that's my excuse. It yeah. becomes a, okay, I'm not very good at this now. How am I going to break it down to a point where I can get better at this and break the challenge down into little chunks? Yeah, this goes back to, and it was something that um, our athlete, David, who ended up in uh, Hawaii, one of his break, big breakthroughs was actually nothing to do with him being in the water. It was the mindset and his approach to turning up to that pool or that open water event. And he approached it with a sense of confidence, being proud. He knows he can do the distance. He knows he can do well. He knows he's been working on the drills that are going to help him get from A to B as efficient as possible. And there was definitely a narrative shift of, I'm a terrible swimmer, but I love getting on the bike and I'm a good runner off the bike. So actually, no, I'm a developing swimmer. I'm working on that. I'm confident with the process I'm going through. I'm supported by my coaches and I'm doing everything that my swim set saying, plus I'm doing extras in terms of all the drills. Then if you turn up to the shore with that mindset, that confidence is going to translate into a relaxed, confident stroke that you can actually perform not only for the first hundred meters of that swim but for the duration of the swim so you know uh, we, we've had many conversations with many athletes over the over the last few months where there's this negative spin on our swimming because we're triathletes and we're good on the bike and we're good on the run but actually we just do the swim because we have to to do a triathlon try and try and drop that if you can and approach it as a developing strong swimmer that's got plenty to work on but the point is you're working on it. So just with that process, you are a strong swimmer and you've got to approach it with a positive mental attitude because it, once it's a negative, it's you're not going to, you, you're already creating this glass ceiling above above your head and it's really hard to break through that. Yeah. So yeah, if you can turn up to the pool really confident, excited, and you believe in the process that you're going through, that's already a, a big gain, I think. Yeah. Totally agree. The more the more athletes we can have in a mindset of, do you know what? I might I might never have looked forward to this in the past, but this has become a challenge I've set myself and I've applied myself to. And let's go out there and see what difference it's made. Mm. And you can Brilliant. do it. We all yeah. think we can't do it. We all think that we're an anomaly and that actually everyone else is getting better, but I'm not. That's not the case. You are one of those people that can get better. You just have to fully commit to a process that you believe in. And if you haven't quite found that process that you believe in, then keep searching and, you know, reach out to your coach, reach out to us if, um, you know, you're not part of Team Oxygen at it yet and ask and talk to other athletes and you will find a solution. And not everyone has the same solution and that's okay, but you've got to, um, you've got to keep searching. Mm. And I think it also, Chris, goes a long way to even acknowledge the fact that a lot of people who do triathlons don't enjoy the swim, don't think of themselves as swimmers, are a little bit afraid of the swim. Because if someone is listening who's new to the sport or new to 70.3 or new to Ironman, I think there is this perception if you go to a club swim it tends to be people who are good at swimming who go to club swims. And so you very quickly get this impression that I remember going to Manchester Tri Club to their swim at the, the Commonwealth Centre in Manchester, 50 metre pool. Everybody seemed to be built like an Adonis. Everybody was a fantastic swimmer. I remember thinking, well, there were 20 odd people at this swim. All 500 members of Manchester Tri Club must be borderline Commonwealth game standard swimmers. Mm. And it was years later I made this, this realisation that the other whatever it is, 450 of them that weren't there 
we're just like me. We're terrified of going. I can't dive off the off the Olympic standard blocks into the water. I couldn't do that. But that's not the reality for most people who want to do a triathlon. The reality of the the level of swimming, I think, is a lot lower than outsiders assume that it is. And the biggest part of it is your mindset toward being willing to have that growth mindset and have that growth physicality to learn to do a new skill differently. Totally. Yeah. So here's my question to you, Rob. Mm. Um, you've got a listener who's going to be integrating all these drills and techniques and confidence, mental aspects to their swimming. How often should they be swimming? So the answer is it depends. It's a, it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but it's also a very important variety answer as well. I think if someone is coming into the sport who can already swim really confidently, they're not going to have to swim as often or as much as somebody who is not from a swimming background and who their biggest limiter is. I don't know even know if I can swim 50 meters yet. If we're talking about that kind of athlete who's coming in, I think a real good ballpark is to aim to get into the water three times a week. Now, you don't have to aim to get in the water for an hour three times a week. I literally mean to get into the water three times a week. So for most people, that might look like one structured session with a club or from a coach or that you've got from somewhere and two other extra sessions that might only be 15 minutes long but that are focusing on the things that are holding you back. In the early days, it's going to be breathing. Then it's going to be specific drills that help with whatever parts of your swim stroke need work on. But I think three times a week is a really good number that allows people to start to feel like, do you know what? I'm in the water really regularly here and I'm starting to get comfortable with it. And that's a big thing in the early days. If athletes can combine a bit of a swim with a, a bike session at the gym or a run session at the treadmill or just having that ability to get in three times, I think can really help beginners out in the early days. Totally agree. And I think, um, and I hope you agree on this one, which is three 20 minute swims is going to be better than one big one hour swim on a Friday. Yeah. It's yeah. Turning up to the pool is kind of half the battle. And if you can keep turning up to the pool, your swimming is going to get more efficient and better. Whereas if you turn up for just one big session a week, you're not going to be able to hold the perfect technique for that whole hour because you're not turning up to the swim enough times in a week. So actually doing 320 swim, 320 minute swims a week is going to go much, much further in your swim development. Yeah. It's always this big challenge, isn't it? Because especially with Ironman training and 70.3 <clears throat> to a slightly lesser extent, there's so much other training going on that when we're looking at an athlete's ability to improve across the entire triathlon, the swim's less than 10% of the event in, in terms of time. So balancing their available training time with like, you know, in the ideal world, we'd all have a pool in our back garden, wouldn't we? And just be able to jump in and a, and a 20 minute swim takes 22 minutes, but it's the trying to balance getting there during the week but i think absolutely in an ideal world if an athlete can do that if you can stop off somewhere on the way home or get in a pool for a lunchtime swim for 20 minutes that can be brilliant and it is worth doing that's the mm. thing it is worth it is going to make a difference to your feel for the water if you have the opportunity but it's balancing that against, well, if you need to get up at five o'clock in the morning anyway, in the winter time, and it means a 4.30 get up, well, there's going to be different considerations around balancing the overall life stress, I think, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, and at this point, I think I can basically hear um, the athletes that we work with asking questions, because I've been talking to them a lot over the past few weeks. And I feel that a lot of the, the, there are recurring themes and to have you answer some of their questions um i think it's going to be a great takeaway so i'll tell you what before we do that yeah i think what we should do we'll break this into two episodes okay and we'll record all of those for next okay. week into that one because we've done what we always do here Gone we've over. ended up <laughs> we've ended up going longer than we planned anyway so let's wrap the second half of what we planned in for part two of this which will come out in another week's time we'll have a second episode up on youtube with all those things in but we'll cover all of the athletes comments and we'll also cover how to specifically train 
So we've gone through the how to learn to be a swimmer part. We'll cover the how to specifically train and break down some of our training sessions in the next episode as well. We'll make it a two-parter. Perfect. So for the athletes listening, what are the actual tangible take takeaways that you'd hope that they've got from, uh, from this session, Rob? I think the most important thing is no matter what speed of swimmer you are, the key thing for success on race day is going to be how calm and how confident you can be in the water. And those things you can build up no matter how fast you are and no matter how fit you are. If you can go in feeling calm and confident in the water, then you are more than halfway there to the challenge of doing a swim well enough to get you through your race. And that goes for people who are fighting the cutoff all the way through to people who are swimming fast enough to potentially be qualifying for the world champs or Kona. With that being said, it might be worth for some athletes listening to when they record their swim sessions. So let's say they've been doing 10 times 100, for example. Don't just record the times that you put per 100. Put a narrative of how it felt. And as the weeks go on, hopefully that's going to go from the first five felt comfortable. But then from five to 10, I was a little bit panicky and my arms started flapping because of the panic. Hopefully as the weeks go on that feeling calm and efficient narrative is going to extend into further into the swim and that's what you're looking for so don't just look at swim times look at the narrative and the kind of physical energy and output that you feel for the same amount of speed yeah you're dead right that's a real big part of it the number on the clock only tells part of the story doesn't it absolutely right well we'll wrap this up here for this week then yeah, well, I've really enjoyed that. And I think we've kind of uh, opened a slight can of worms because there's so much to go out in swimming. So, yeah, I think we'll be back with more question and answers on this one. Yeah, good. Looking forward to part two. And for people who are sitting and listening on YouTube, if you've liked what you've heard today and you're looking out there to get some help with your triathlon coaching, please get in contact with us. You can contact us through the website at team.oxygenaddict.com. You can email us at help.oxygenaddict.com. I think Team Oxygen Addict has got the most comprehensive training plans and programs for busy age groupers out there. We specialize in helping athletes who want to complete 70.3 or Ironman, but also have busy professional lives and family lives and they've got all those things to balance so if you're interested we'll put a link down underneath this video you can click on it and book through to have a chat with us about whether you'd be a good fit for joining team oxygen addict and how we can best help you out with your training for your upcoming events this year so we hope you've enjoyed this episode and join us again for the next episode when we'll be answering exactly how we structure our Ironman and 70.3 swim training and also some common questions that have come in from our athletes. <laughs>